Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our joint webinar between Thorogood and Datarix, focusing on the case for rapid market data analytics in uh, a COVID-19 world. Just a couple of quick introductions here. We're going to be joined by Rob from Databrick. So Rob Saker, he is a global industry lead focused on specifically on retail manufacturing. I'm not going to steal his thunder. I'll let him introduce himself a bit more when he gets going. Uh, my name is Deb Lee. I'm joined by my colleague, Ben Dunmire. Um, we uh, work for Thoroughgood. We are BI and data analytics consultants. So we really specialize in sort of end-to-end -end delivery of this type of work. And recently... Um, sort of throughout the pandemic, more specifically, we've both been working um, uh, with large CPG customers on sort of delivering uh, sort of rapid experimentation and productionized results uh, for senior leadership to make actions that are data driven. So I'm going to hand it over to Rob now. Let's take you guys through. Thanks, Deb. And um, thank you, everybody, for attending today's session and um, uh, the privilege of uh, speaking with you today. You know, uh, I was uh, putting together notes in terms of how do we talk about this. Uh, this is a common challenge that I hear when we speak with all of our customers at Databricks, which is uh, the uncertainty that's been caused by 2020. And how do we use uh, data and analytics to better respond to the volatility that we're seeing? Um, a quick background on myself. Uh, I'm, as mentioned, I lead uh, retail and manufacturing, but I came from the practitioner side of the business and, uh, you know, I worked through the challenges of doing forecasting and analysis and all the way up to, to senior leadership roles in an organization, but I've never personally dealt with the volatility that we've experienced in 2020. And I think that's fair for all of us. If there is one word that I think that best describes 2020, it is volatility. Major disruptions have happened in every corner of the world and it's impacted nearly every facet of life. The most notable disruption was certainly COVID, uh, as a result of COVID and the subsequent quarantines, we've seen entire swaths of the economy shut down. Major manufacturing centers in Asia went cold. 10% uh, of the global shipping fleet was idled, with ships sitting in harbors or anchored in protected uh, areas. Traffic in dense urban areas, such as my hometown of Atlanta, became non-existent. Shanghai and Los Angeles had so little traffic that their once smog-ridden skylines were clear. Congested commutes became quiet as people shifted to working from home or worse, not working at all. The impact of COVID was substantial with an overall retraction expected in global GDP. Uh, I think the number I saw from last night is we expect 3 trillion in, in reduction in, in global GDP. In the area that I focus on, retail revenues are expected to decline by 10.5% this year. Retailers that are entirely dependent on on-premise business were hit much harder with some categories such as apparel declining by 70 percent e-commerce retailers and grocery have seen reverse fortune their revenue has surged as people switch their buying behaviors to online or switch their eating habits from restaurants to grocery stores an estimated 120 billion dollars worth of food spend is shifting from qsr's quick service restaurant to grocery channels this year so why is this volatility a problem for how we analyze our businesses well, let's look at how we would traditionally build forecasting models that you'd use to predict your future. Well, the first step in building the forecasting model is to bring in my historic transaction data. That's what this chart represents. Uh, the, uh, if you want to predict what's happening in two months from now, what happened a year ago and two years ago in that same month are solid assumptions of what it will look like. This helps us account for seasonality and common behaviors, like going back to school, holidays, uh, or summer vacation. In this case, we're looking at point of sales data, but this could be production data, service calls, or any number of different transactions. The next step is you want to layer in causal data. And causal data, think of that as the events or activities that may influence the level of the transactions. Now, this could include promotions that you run. Uh, but it could also include things that your competitors are doing or things that are happening in the environment. Weather's a great example of this. People like to drink cold beer when it's warm, but not on super hot days. Now I've exaggerated the chart for effect here, but think of causal data changing how your baseline forecast operates. And here's what happened in 2020. Your forecasting and analytics have broken in 2020 because 2020 looks like nothing uh, that happened in 2019 or 2018 from that baseline perspective. 
And not just that, those causal factors have been completely disrupted in 2020. It doesn't matter how nice the weather is outside. If everyone is quarantined, they're still not going out to eat. But you might think, well, 2020 is an anomaly. We've never had a year like 2020. 2021, it's going to all go back to normal. <laughs> While 2020 is certainly unique, we actually have major disruptions to our society far more than we like to remember. And the reason for this is uh, that humans have evolved with what scientists call an optimism bias. Now, an optimism bias is a wonderful thing for a species that is trying to evolve and thrive over the eons. It's what we needed to overcome the realities that we face in our evolution. You know, I've got a spear, so of course I can kill that woolly mammoth. I mean, I don't recall anybody saying anything bad about the last time they tried this. Or, of course, I'll get on a small ship and sail halfway around the world to settle a new continent. I haven't heard anyone saying anything about that, bad about that in years. Uh, optimism bias is what we've depended on to give us the courage to pursue things that were incredibly stupid, but it's a horrible way of managing a business. We think about the positive things that have been happening in society, but recorded history shows that bad things happen far more frequently than we recall. And as you can see from the chart, the rate of bad things is increasing. Now, these are just some of the major disasters of unrest that's impacted society in 2020. There was major flooding in China. Some people were concerned the Three Gorges Dam was going to break. Thankfully, it didn't. We had monsoons that flooded South Asia and the hurricanes in the U.S. Civil unrest has impacted many parts of the world, including riots in the U.S., protests in the Middle East, and uprisings in Africa. Major wildfires in Brazil and Western U.S. have burned millions of acres. Okay, so maybe meth gators haven't really impacted society this year, but we should remain vigilant. So volatility is severely impacting our businesses, and traditional sources of analysis are inflexible and unable to respond to those changes. Disruptions occur far more frequently than people estimate. I think if we talk about the new normal, volatility is the new normal. And traditional data services that you think about that measure risk and impact internal technology uh, approaches for measuring this are too slow for, for uh, being able to respond to these needs. So what's a prescription for how you can build resiliency using data and AI to respond to this market volatility? Well, first, I think you need to look at leveraging alternate data sources. Companies should look at the full breadth of data, both batch and real time, internal and external data to expand their awareness of the events and the environment around them. Next, I think you need to incorporate structured, semi-structured and unstructured data. And only 3% of a company's data actually resides in your data warehouse. Resilient companies look at the full range of data, including video, images, PDFs, and more. They extract useful information from these different sources that they then use to drive greater insights. This is all meaningless unless you have a culture of rapid experimentation. Challenge your data scientists to deliver insights in days. Deliver MVPs that enable you to quickly identify problems or opportunities and then scale the most successful of those analytics across your entire company. And lastly, focus on improving outcomes, not merely generating insights. PowerPoint presentations aren't insights. You need to think about how do you design an insights ecosystem that enables your data scientists to deliver new insights directly to your front line for decisioning. So remember this slide from the beginning? These represented key areas that were impacting our businesses. What do you see when you look at these images? We chose these images carefully because in each of them, we can start to extract useful information about the uh, environment around us. In all these instances and more, we have sets of real-time information that are widely available that show what's happening. Now, I see a manufacturing plant activity at my suppliers and my competitors. I see shipping container vessels idled where my competitors often route their containers. I see major flooding that may impair my ability to get key parts. I see roads with traffic near some of my restaurants and not at others. I see anonymized debit and credit card information that shows how and where consumers are spending, news media that's telling me what uh, events are happening around the globe, and social media data that tells me what people are talking about. The challenge is that this information is often in forms that make it difficult to use. It's unstructured. It's in the form of images, PDFs, and raw text. Traditional data systems like data warehouses only use structured data and sales data. And it's difficult to test to see if it's useful. 
And this is why many companies have limited their analysis to a small set of information that can explain, explain their environment, or it was. So this brings us to the purpose of today's conversation. What most companies need is a quick way to take these different data sets, convert them into useful information, and test that information to see if it contributes to the understanding of your business. And this is where Databricks fits in. Databricks is a unified data and analytics platform that enables you to use structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data, both batch and streaming, and process that to useful information for analysis and reporting. Once the data is processed into information that we can understand, Databricks provides industry-leading capabilities to enable your teams to perform ad hoc data science, production machine learning at scale, or even traditional reporting. And the best part about this is that you can do this quickly and inexpensively, unlike your traditional systems. The challenge with doing this is it requires a solid framework for determining which information makes sense, ingesting or processing those data, and quickly applying that towards common problems that you're dealing with. And this is where Thoroughgood comes in. I'm really excited for them to talk about this, but I'm gonna leave that for them to discuss. What this pattern enables is a much more rapid response to uh, the rapidly changing conditions in the environment. Let's compare the traditional ways that you would go about monitoring the environment. First, you might license a syndicated service that focuses on trends and behaviors in the market. There are hundreds of these firms out there, but they basically function in the same way. They capture a range of data, they aggregate it, they process that information, they generate insights, and then they deliver that in a summarized form for you typically more than a month later. These are often higher level views, and they're well beyond the date of being useful for making immediate decisions. The second option for monitoring the environment is to bring this into a data warehouse. And remember, data warehouses depend on highly structured data. So we will acquire the data and then go through all the activities that are required before you can use the data in the data warehouse. We'll model the database, get that design approved, create what are called ETLs, extract, transform, load, to transform it, develop the scripts and create the database tables. And then we'll load the database, uh, data into the database. And all of that before we can start to build our analysis. You'll be lucky if this takes you a few months. Data warehouses are designed for stable, highly normalized data. They're not built for experimentation. They're also not capable of processing alternative data sets like unstructured and semi-structured data. So you'll be waiting forever if you want the data warehouse to help you there. And lastly, what does this timeline look with Databricks and Thoroughgood? Well, first, we grab the data, put it in our inexpensive cloud storage, and then immediately our data scientists can begin to experiment with this data. They can test to see if it's valuable before we invest in making it ready for broad usage. If it doesn't prove successful, just delete it, capture your learnings, and move on. If it does prove useful, work on productionizing your models. And this can take days or weeks, depending on your team, and the output can be made available for more ad hoc analysis, machine learning models running at scale, or even serve to BI reports and dashboards. As you think about ways you can start to improve the measurement of your business, start thinking about how you can experiment with different types of data and data from outside your four walls to improve your read of the market. At left is the typical way that I think about structuring data for econometric models. This is a commercial view that looks at pricing, product, promotion, and distribution, but you could uh, easily build a similar supply chain centric view. We have the internal data that I control, and this could be SAP, sales data, CRM, or things like shop floor images, closed caption TV. I next look at competitive data where I can acquire it and align it to my business. And this allows me to answer questions like, how do I compare on pricing relative to my competitors? And lastly, what are the environmental forces? What are the things that are happening in the environment that will impact my business? Weather, crime, consumer movement, consumer spending, economic forces. There are many commercial data pro providers in this space, but you can also go a long way with many of the free data sets. In fact, one of the most popular ones that we use is GDEL, which is a real-time source of news data from around the world. I think I've set the stage for my friends at Thoroughgood to take over, but before I do, I encourage you to focus on four things as you look at delivering a more agile business insights capability. Uh, leverage alternative data sets, look beyond your traditional views to see what other data explains your business. Look for data that intersects with your business and highlights opportunities or challenge. 
consider real-time data to accelerate your decision uh, timelines. In the time of volatility, long-term forecasts are less important than the cumulative effect of many smaller short-term decisions. Incorporate structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. Use the power of Spark and Databricks to transform this raw information into useful analysis. Build that culture of rapid experimentation. Challenge your data science teams uh, with Thoroughgood to deliver results in days and weeks. And lastly, focus on improving outcomes, not merely generating insights. Focus on how you can take these capabilities and put them in the hands of people that are making the decision on the front line. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Deb to uh, walk through her section of the presentation. I am going to sort of just giving you a view of what we're going to talk about next. So I'm going to set the stage a bit more in terms of like what we've actually been seeing from like a real experience, I think. So really the case for change in terms of building in um, a culture that has speed and resiliency from an uh, experimentation perspective. I'm going to then take you through an actual use case because I think it's like we can talk about uh, experimentation and sort of socializing outcomes to um, the people who are making decisions. But I want to really give you a view of what that actually looks like in terms of like what we've actually been doing. Um, and then I'm going to pass it over to Ben. And he's going to take you through another use case. And then he'll take us home with a bit around how do we actually get started here and some of the offerings that Thoroughgood and Databricks uh, have. So in terms of the case for change, I think uh, Rob had touched on a couple of the points that I'm going to make. But what we have seen uh, has been really successful on some of the projects that we've been working on has been start with narrowing your focus and make anything that you're going to be sort of focusing on from an outcomes perspective actionable. So there is quite a bit in terms of data out there, but narrowing your focus is not only going to help you sort of focus on, you know, what are my top key accounts, my top products, um, but then also make it more actionable by doing so. Always lead, I would say, with those business priorities. So you want to prioritize, um, you know, the areas of insights that leaders have identified that are going to be most valuable, and then you want to go and invest sort of aggressively in those areas specifically. You want to balance repeatability and experimentation. So this isn't like a new uh, problem, I would say, from a data science perspective, but I think it's even more important as you're building that experimentation culture out, um, is sort of making sure that the people on your team have the ability to sort of, um, you know, experiment and it's sort of it's open for them and they're not being restricted by what they can do. But you also want to make sure that they're balancing, okay, well, you know, we don't want to be rewriting code all the time. How can we how can we strike that balance? Uh, between them, use alternative data sources. So I think Rob made this point, um, but it's really only going to help uh, to bring those in. I'm going to show you a couple of examples during my demo as well. Make sure that you can actually productionize whatever you're building. So when you're sort of enabling those teams uh, to move from experimentation to production, your your value uh, from what you're generating, so how are you going to actually improve those outcomes, is really only going to be realized when people can actually start um, consuming them and using that information to make better decisions. Um, and then avoiding some of the inherent biases. So I think that, um, I know Rob had spoken a bit around like the optimism bias, but I think that especially during times of COVID when everybody in the world has been affected, right? We're going to have thoughts on what we think is happening that we're going to want to test down, stuff like that. And I think making sure that you're sort of pulling yourself back and applying sort of rigorous statistical methodologies to make sure that you know, what you're finding in your models is actually statistically significant is more important now than it, than it ever was, especially as you're bringing in some of that um, alternative data. So in I want to talk a bit around sort of why Databricks is like the tool uh, to do this. Um, it has sort of that unified platform for both the data engineering and data science offerings, giving you sort of a cloud space for collaboration. So multiple people can work in the same notebook at once, flexibility in languages and performance. Um, that massive flexible scaling. So really, uh, whether you're experimenting or you're doing production workloads and huge data sets, very flexible in terms of being able to scale up. Um, you can perform, I would say, either ad hoc analyses or make them repeatable, depending on how you build your code out, um, which will also then save you time and give you back more time to actually analyze those insights. And then integration with multiple cloud platforms is going to give you sort of the best of both worlds in terms of uh, sort of flexibility there. So you're not pigeonholed by one technology or one data visualization technology to actually, you know, uh, get your insights out. A uh, couple of points here, use the data lake um, with Delta Lake. 
Uh, Rob had spoken quite a bit around this, but definitely want to like take advantage of a data like infrastructure so you're not sort of limited by that 3% that's available in your data warehouse. Um, use sort of those enterprise data sources as needed. So if you don't want to repeat necessarily like the cleansing steps or anything like that, use the APIs, you know, maybe sort of the open data source sets like the weather data, for example, use an API to bring that in. Um, it'll also integrate quite nicely. It'll play nicely with the orchestration components. So this is especially important for productionization, right? Because I don't want to have to just go in and manually run my notebook every time the data gets refreshed. I want it to be automated. I want it to be orchestrated. Data visualization. So how do you show people some of those insights uh, once you've gotten to them? And how I'm going to talk about this more in my demo, but um, you know, the so what behind it, right? How do people actually see what you're working on, understand it, and use it? And finally, the machine learning products. So once you like, once you've created the model and you want to move to production, that model may need to change, obviously, in the future. Like we're talking about massive disruption here. So having it right onto a tool like MLflow, for example, model registry, being able to track and model log the changes and stuff like that, having um, Databricks right out to one of those tools like that is going to give you uh, sort of the most flexibility in terms of managing your machine learning models. So moving on to my use case, uh, my intent in terms of this demo is I don't I don't want you to be focusing necessarily on like all the numbers I'm going to be showing like uh, you know for the purposes of the demo. I think the like. To take, if you're going to take something away from this, it should be to understand and get a view of how does this experimentation sort of uh, life cycle and getting some of those insights out to the users. How does that actually happen, and how does that how does that work? So I'm going to give you a bit of context on like the type of model wherein I'm forecasting sales volume. Um, but really, here uh, what I want you to walk away with is a sense of okay, how could I actually do this? How could I do this type of experimentation, and how can I socialize? and help them improve their outcomes uh, using sort of the insights in a BI format as well. So just to give a bit of background on the type of model and something that we've seen has been very useful from a COVID-19 perspective in terms of modeling are uh, dynamic linear models with a uh, with Bayesian multi-state applied to them. So these are gonna be a type of linear regression model. The parameters are treated as time varying, so they're not gonna be static. Um, and then applying that sort of multi-state on top of them means that they can be configured to automatically cope with periods where your time series is disrupted. And we know, just looking at the world today, that we are expecting the parameters to change. So it's a very good use case for this type of modeling. Um, and especially thinking about uh, some of the stuff that we've been doing in the context of COVID-19, you know, throughout some of those, uh, the crazy periods that we've all been living through, like in the past eight months, um, what's pretty what's pretty useful with these models is that they can be used to step through, you know, that pre-lockdown history. So wherever you are in the world, that might have been like November through the spring, for example. But throughout um, that volatility of the lockdown, so when everybody was rushing to the grocery store and stocking up on toilet paper and sort of that reemergence into a post-lockdown period where we are now seeing is somewhat resembling a new normal, right? So you want your parameters to be able to adapt automatically uh, in a way that's best going to account for changes on a statistical likelihood basis. So when I say multi-state, I mean, you know, the statistical likelihood of the models being in that state. And these multi-state regression models, we're going to be able to, you can use them to estimate that level of trend, the price elasticity, impact of distribution exhibited in a time series. So thinking about sort of why has this been useful, it's been very, very key to be able to model how markets have been changing based off of what we're seeing in the data. But then, so give us that past explainability, but then really what's going to happen in the future in the face of more uncertainty, because there's not going to be some sort of magic bullet in 2021 where everything just reverses, right? Some of the things that Rob was talking about earlier. We're trying to answer questions like, am I recession ready? Like, how am I doing in the recession? Have there been any significant price promotion distribution trends that have changed due to COVID-19? What factors are contributing most to my performance, my competitor's performance? Just to give you a view of, say I'm going to be showing a bit of code and I don't want it to be overwhelming, sort of the sort of overall flow of the model. Um, we have mapping of the data sets happening first. So this cannot be understated just in terms of needing to think about how you map, especially some of those alternative data sets to your own sort of internal, external point of sale, um, you know, internal SAP, CRM systems data sets. And then so next, even before you get to you know the regression itself, you want to do a bit of experimentation in terms of the inputs. So what are their significance to my my output variable, or my forecasted sales volume? You know, um, and I think as Rob had mentioned before, this is sort of the stage where 
you're going to be going through and just identifying and seeing, you know, does this even look like it's an important to my model, some key indicators beforehand. Take the model, train it, and test it. So I think the, one of the more interesting points around training these types of models is, and what's been different from what we've seen in the past is, you kind of have to throw a lot of your historical data out the window. Because if you remember that graph that Rob was showing, our baseline forecast is not accounting for any type of disruption. But now we're at a point where we do have a bit of data from a disruption standpoint. So, you know, you might want to train this model on that period, uh, you know, of lockdown and when people were panic buying, quarter buying as a model that sort of, you know, might prepare you better for the next lockdown, right? If there's a second outbreak. Obviously, this is an iterative process. You're going to analyze those results and you want to iterate through them, make some tweaks, come back to it. But then finally, then... I have a model, I'm pretty happy with it. I have a couple of models actually. How do you turn those into insights and make them actionable? So in the, um, so the flow that I'm gonna give you guys is, um, in this case, we're going to be viewing sort of various different scenarios from a model that are output um, in Tableau. A couple of assumptions here to call out that are pretty important in terms of creating any of these types of models. Um, I would say that having, uh, you know, the business knowledge, so, even if you have a full team of data scientists, making sure that you have people aligned to these initiatives who really understand what may be happening for, say, you know, that brand or that competitive market or that retailer that you're focusing in on, right? So knowing that, you know, someone like, uh, you know, some drugstores, for example, run promotions quite more frequently than other types of retailers, right? So even that type of knowledge, which can shape the types of inputs that you put into your model, is going to save you quite a bit of time and also give you better accuracy in terms of what you're looking at. The other thing that I will call out is what we've seen is you kind of need a bit of shift in a mindset. And we've, um, especially from like a data engineering perspective in terms of mapping some of those data sets, you may need to be a bit more creative in how you sort of group them and then map them into some of your other external and internal data sets because it's not necessarily always going to be one to one, right? But you need to basically build in some assumptions. And the better those assumptions are, right, uh, the more sort of the better the results will be from the model. So ultimately, we're looking to sort of rapidly experiment to create models that are going to help us better explain the past and the future with not just sort of my own data and sort of my classic, uh, you know, my Nielsen or my IRI data set, but how do I bring in other things to help me better explain the past? I'm going to hop over now into um, Tableau. So from a story perspective, and what I want to get across here is what we've seen in a lot of our customers is that um, they already have, uh, you know, views and snapshots of like what's happening with my brands. So in this example here, um, you know, my fruit snack brand here, Lee Fruit Snacks, this is my executive snapshot dashboard. I come in here, um, you know, the data gets refreshed every couple of weeks. But what I've noticed um, more recently is that, you know, coming out of the pandemic, or I would say I should say pre-pandemic, my, um, you know, my brand was a lot more competitive with my biggest competitor, Dunmire Chips, Ben's Chip brand, um, sort of coming into the lockdown period. But what I've noticed now is, you know, every time I go to this dashboard, that my share in the market is just trailing and trailing and trailing. I don't really know why. We haven't we haven't changed much from what we were doing, you know, last summer. But we we have a pretty, you know, we're a bit worried because something may have changed in the market. We're not, our models aren't picking up for it. We're consistently underperforming relative to where we think we should be and our share is suffering as a result. So you can see here, I have a number of metrics that I'm looking at, but this doesn't really give me that much explainability. And this isn't, this isn't enough, right? You, we need to do like a bit more. We need to go digging. We need to see if there's a better way that we can explain things. So <clears throat> I'm going to hop over now to uh, Databricks. So what we've seen is a lot of our customers already have like this. They're seeing this happen right now, but they're not necessarily um, doing enough from an experimentation standpoint to try to really dig in and see, is there more happening that our current data sets are not picking up on? If you uh, sort of head into Databricks, I'm signed in already, I'm logged in, I just have all this pulled up and run already from a demo perspective. What we've seen has been really effective from a ways of working perspective is that uh, we sort of have these shared collaborative experimentation workspaces. And within a workspace, um, there could be sort of a number of different notebooks here that, you know, I haven't necessarily built all these. But what's really powerful about it is that, um, you know, some other team members that I'm working with, they've developed, you know, the code to bring in and process like some of this um, sentiment data, for example, um, they have some unstructured coupons data. We're also bringing in um, unemployment uh, claims, uh, insurance claims, and then COVID uh, as well. So 
COVID data sets, so like the confirmed number of cases, the day on day change rate, things like that. So you can see I'm, I'm starting to bring in a number of different types of open source data sets. And you can imagine that as you bring in more and more, you can scale out this list. Once they're, once I have those notebooks built, that processing, and I have the code built to map them to what I want, I can just grab somebody else's notebook, run it, and reference it. I don't even need to write the code to remap it in for myself. So for the purposes of this demo, a lot of this code has already been um, already been mapped and brought in. Um, but that's sort of the first step that you would do. Uh, so looking at my notebook now, this is a notebook that has been optimized for analysis um, and experimentation. So you can see here I've created widgets at the top that are going to allow me to parameterize the inputs that I run to this model um, with two clicks. So um, I can I can specify my competitor, right? Because I want to see, you know, are my competitors prices, my you know, my competitors um, distribution sort of affecting my forecasted sales volume, for example. So I do want to include some of that information from an inputs perspective. Um, so I can go in a couple of clicks, select what I want to look at, right? Because I don't necessarily know what my results are going to be when I'm first starting off. I can also go in, um, select a number of different input features. So you could say here, if I wanted to test it with those initial unemployment claims that were filed um, on a, like a state-by-state -state basis for every week, those are released by the Department of Labor. I can include those. I can look at the continued claims. I can look at the insured unemployment rate. I can also look at COVID cases and deaths as well. So these are all things that I can quickly bring into my notebook and um, start experimenting with with a few clicks. Uh, obviously, you want to specify you know, the output variable that you're trying to explain for this type of modeling. And then typically, you're going to sort of start small and then maybe scale up, right? So from a uh, like a retailer perspective, maybe just selecting one or a few maybe within the same channel. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through uh, some of the code that'll get me like able to run the models. But um, here, I do want to call out, if you parameterize sort of the training periods as well, this is what I was talking about. If I wanted to just parameterize and specify my training periods just for the COVID-19 you know, lockdown when I thought that it was going to be most affected, right? Um, I can filter and just update these right here. I hit that run all button, and then like that, everything is just going to run through. Um, so I really don't need to do much to retest different periods, right? Uh, minute old, this notebook runs in, I would say, like a couple minutes. So I can quickly get the results that I want to see. Databricks is great for sort of on-the-fly calculations as well. So um, I think Rob had been talking about how it is great when you have a data warehouse that has you know, all of your pre calc everything, and um, you know all the data is cleansed and normalized and mapped together. You could join it, start schema. However, I think that you know, for this type of analysis, you need to be able to just sort of do stuff on the fly. So like rolling averages that aren't going to be stored in your base data, for example, stuff like that. I can just go in and type these in right here. Um, and I have a function basically created that's going to add those like that. And now I can just use them as inputs. Um, coming down here, I'm going to pre-process my source data a little bit, create those widgets. Um, and then, so a couple of highlights here from an experimentation perspective. So how do you actually start using this, right? So I've got all my data in here. You know, I'm working in Databricks. I'm I'm starting to look at these. So now I really want to understand what my inputs look like. So um, what's really nice is you can switch between like PySpark and Pandas, for example, depending on, you know, if I wanted to use the pair plot, right? So you can see here, I can quickly run this um, command cell, which runs in like eight seconds, I would say, to basically start visualizing the relationships of all the input and the ex the output variable here with a few clicks. So this is very powerful because I don't have to I don't have to export anything on a Databricks. <laughs> I don't have to dump it into Power BI or Tableau or Excel for that matter, just to be able to analyze it. Um, and if I want to change the different variables that I'm looking at at any point in time, all I have to do is really just go up here, add a few more, um, and then run the notebook as well. So you can start to get a sense of how Databricks has shifted from a data science perspective and exploratory data analysis how you're shifting from you know, spending your time just writing the code and then going back, rewriting it, rerunning it right on your local machine or something in R to um, you know, a few clicks here and there. And I spend all my time now actually analyzing my data and understanding what it means for the model. Um, it's huge. So similar with you know, using heat maps or correlations, all I need to do is just add a few more things. I can see things like my price discount, my promotion frequencies, you know, my items on the shelf, my distribution, all correlating to that, you know, that volume sales that I'm trying to forecast. So once I've done a bit of experimentation and analysis in terms of my uh, 
inputs. I'm going to, you know, split. I'm going to run some summary statistics on the data, train the model. I'm going to fit the model. Um, coming down here as well, just another point to call out is from a Bayesian multi-state model perspective, one of the things I'm going to be very interested, in, especially understanding that past behavior are the coefficients of my different variables that I've passed through the model. So Databricks is really flexible in terms of being able to quickly analyze and see what they look like from a trend. You can just customize the plot here in terms of what's being outputted in here. Nothing Nothing has to be written back out to a visualization tool, and I can get the values in the tool tip uh, just like this. And so if I wanted to rerun this with everything else, I just hit run all and I have it all. So obviously, you're going to want to test the model performance. You're going to want to test it on the training and the testing data sets. So let's say now I've, you know, I've spent the time doing the analysis, doing the experimentation. I have um, a couple of different models that I'm pretty happy with that model effectively different scenarios. So what? How do you turn this into an actual insight? Um, if I come back to the dashboard that I had before, uh, some of the things that we've been talking about. So you're going to want to, you know, get that model productionized. Um, the different ones, you're going to want to have them in a system where you don't need to have somebody sort of running that notebook every single time. You know, somebody wants to see the updated data. But what you should be able to get to is, um, you know, a view for people who don't necessarily, they don't need to know all the code sitting behind it, right? But what they need to see is like, what do those different scenarios that that model is outputting look like for me? Um, and how is it going to help me? How is it going to improve my outcomes? So you can see here, I have, you know, my actuals and my baseline and my pink line here for my fruit snacks. But if I switch between, you know, the models, scenario one, scenario two, which could be based off of a number of different assumptions, you know, you might be modeling like, uh, you know, the Southwest Belt states have a second, um, you know, where some of my biggest retailers are, have a second outbreak of COVID, right? For example, and I have some variables that would be pretty good indicators of that, so I can set those with the prior. So my scenario could just be modeling something like that happening and how we react to it, right? What do we do? You know, we don't, we shouldn't be sending as much on promotion necessarily because foot traffic is going to be down in those stores, right? I think thinking about things like that, you can capture that type of business thinking in your model to model a scenario. Um, and then you can basically socialize these types of insights to the people who really just need to be able to say, is this going to give me, what's the uplift that this is going to give me? Like, why is this valuable to me? What's it going to give? So you can see here, something simple where you can just sort of show them the scenarios. They know what the scenarios are, obviously, in these examples. Uh, but this is how you really take that experimentation modeling to an actionable insight that's going to ultimately improve your outcomes. So, all right, I'm going to hand it over to Ben now to take us home. So I think it was a really interesting demo and, and to hear about how we're you know, switching, you know, the way in which we're forecasting, which has been done for years into kind of a, a different methodology and, and seeing how the disruption in the whole road is playing into it. I'll, uh, I'll build off that with an, another use case and, and pull on a number of the threads um, that both Rob and Deb had touched on. So thinking about the use of alternative data sets, uh, the use of technology to quickly narrow down what we need to look at and what we need to do about it. So I'll introduce it here briefly, um, what the point of it is, what the value we're trying to get out of this, um, this analytical approach. So first, an, an anomaly or outlier you might have heard is, I guess, the simplest form, um, a point of data or a, 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 an example or scenario that falls outside of a, a deviation or where you would expect it to be. Uh, you know, so something that is behaving erratically or where you would not expect it to be based on you know, prior knowledge. So that's the kind of statistical or, or uh, you know, technical approach we're going to take. And on top of that, if we're thinking about um, you know, CPG as an example, one you know, super helpful approach at the moment, and, and Deb touched on this, is understanding what our, what our brands or what our product groups are doing. So something like decomposing share. So I want to understand really who's winning, who's losing, who's staying the same, because that can you know help me capitalize on where I'm winning, um, address some of my weaknesses where I'm losing, um, and and by those, by those strings. So when we're looking at uh, kind of decomposing share, we want to understand kind of at the base level what the market is doing, um, and then within that market, how our products or services or offerings are doing. Um, like I mentioned, so I'll give a bit of an example here, one we can um, truly relate to. So we think about the market for hand sanitizer, which obviously has grown um, extremely rapidly over the, the last uh, couple of months, six months or so. So, uh, you know, in the world, in the U.S., where whatever market we define, uh, we expect the sales for hand sanitizer to be growing. Right. But what I want to know is how is my hand sanitizer product through, uh, doing uh, 
is it declining? Um, in this case, in my example, it is declining. So I, I have a pretty big opportunity here, right? There's a, a market, a, a, a you know, something that people are buying. There's, there's demand is increasing for something, whether it's in a specific channel or a specific product, but I'm not doing as well as I should be. I'm, I'm losing share. Um, there's opportunity for me. So this is something I really want to bubble up. If I can narrow this down to you know, a specific region, a specific channel, set of retailers, whatever it is, I can, I can do something about it. So what are some of the other questions um, that, that we're thinking about? Um, so my key markets, so where do I play it and how am I doing there? How specifically are my brands and products doing and, and really how are my competitors doing, right? In some cases, it's, it's, it's about, you know, how are we beating our competitors? Um, it might also uh, lead us to think about it, and Rob mentioned this, uh, do we need to invest in completely different channels um, or different retailers or different ways in which we're marketing and selling and advertising, promoting our products? Uh, to think about uh, how e-commerce, for example, comes into play. Um, and in and, and general, I think, and I think the, the, the real point of this demo is to think about how do I narrow down my focus and, and get a concise or uh, kind of quick view of what's happening. So there's so much, you know, Rob talked about volatility and uncertainty, and there's you know, so many different products, so many different places in which I could be selling something. How do I, how do I figure out where to look? How do I identify the problems? How do I identify the opportunities? Uh, and really, how are how are consumer buying habits evolving, and how do I evolve with them? So to give a bit of a, a brief on um, the approach that I'll talk through in Databricks, a pretty brief way. First, like that, we'll do some data preparation. So identify data sources, um, do some calculations. I want to calculate share. I'll do a different cuts of the data, um, and then and kind of prepare the data to be yeah, easier to analyze, easier to report on. In anomaly detection, I want to determine you know, the ways in which I'm classifying an outlier or an anomaly. Um, so there's you know, numerous different uh, methods and, and you know, it's, it's often helpful to apply uh, a couple of different types. And I'll, and I'll show a few examples of what we've done in this, in this use case. But I want to figure out how am I going to classify something as an outlier or not. We we'll want to actually do that calculation. So we've defined our, our methodology. We'll have to actually do it. Um, and then it's, it's also helpful to um, do some sort of prioritization or summarization. So I have, I have a lot of data points. My outliers and anomalies are telling me some information, but how do I figure out which ones to look at? How can I see, you know, who, uh, you know, where outliers are occurring most frequently, where they are, you know, largest uh, deviating, um, you know, the, the most amount or things like that. So, you know, putting a bit of a bit of logic on top of that identification of outliers to, to you know, rank them to an extent. And then lastly, uh, and just like Deb said, um, we've got this, you know, great analysis. We have this, um, you know, valuable data. How do we, how do we make some decisions or make take some actions from it? So how do we, uh, you know, how do we distill this information into a few decision points, um, a few recommendations that we can take to senior leaders? A few assumptions here, and, and a bit about the about this specific demo and use case, but but kind of just generally in in how we're approaching experimentation, um, rapid responses to you know, COVID. One thing is level of detail. So I mentioned making things actionable. It's it's you know it, it's helpful to know what's happening overall, but you can't often uh, often do a lot about that. But I can do something if I know a specific pack size within a, a specific retailer, for example. So it's thinking about how do we balance uh, the complexity and, and amount of data, for example, with, um, with something that we can actually do uh, take an action from. Um, and a point Deb made, but uh, coupling the statistical analysis um, and understanding of technology and data with business knowledge is, is of paramount importance. We have to understand why we're doing something um, and how to do it um, to, to really get any benefit or value from it. And thinking about the different ways in which we're defining markets. So is it an area? Is it the group of products? All kinds of different cuts. We need to narrow it down though. We need to, we need to have some focus. And ultimately, we're thinking about Kind of rapid generation of information and insights that we can uh, use to focus ourselves on, on on the important parts of our business or you know, important areas we need to we need to identify and, and fix. Or I'm going to jump over and uh, show a few examples here pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, I just have my Databricks window open here, and I'll, I'll pretty briefly go through this. But um, at, at the start, and, and you can see above. Um, the top of my screen, uh, like Deb, I have a number of widgets, and I've kind of used these just to help me more elegantly and quickly transition through um, the different cuts of my data. So, you know, I have different categories I might want to look at. Um, I want might want to include or exclude, you know, some um, alternative data sources. I might even want to tinker with my sensitivity of my outliers. So, 
uh, depending how I'm looking, I might want to, uh, you know, effectively broaden that uh, that distribution of, of the standard the standard distribution of, of what I classify as an outlier or not. So kind of some interesting stuff. We can add in a bit of a bit of uh, elegance to uh, to our experimentation. I'll do some data preparation. So like Deb, I've also used that same unemployment and COVID uh, data. I've also pulled on um, some app macroeconomic features. So um, S&P as an example. So things like price index for this case, I was really interested in. So able to pipe that into Databricks and, you know, if I don't, if it's not useful or I want to try something else, pretty quick to do so. And then I have my point of sale data and I'll do a bit of data prep and um, you know, organize it and, and, and calculate my, sh my shares. And, you know, Databricks is great. I can get a bit of, do a bit of guess and check. Um, I can also, yeah, validation, but also uh, initial analysis. So get a sense of, of what's happening, um, which is always helpful. And, and, and like Deb said, it can get some quick insights and some, some quick assurances of, of what you're seeing and why why you're seeing it. So we see some other sort of charts here. Um, and then what I really want to do is bring together all this data and calculate some of my kind of outlier um, features, so to speak. So, um, you know, I want to calculate a, a number of different things. So I want to look at um, the market overall. So is the market um, growing or winning? Air market specific brands um, growing or declining? Um, and then trying to understand, is it a factor of the market getting bigger? So is are more hand sanitizer products being sold? Is it a factor of my brand doing better in that market? And so on and so forth. So you can get those different factors as you decompose share. And there's lots of different ways to go about decomposing decomposing share. So again, some visuals, we can get a sense of those those outlier definitions, make sure they're sensible, start getting a, a view and, and forming our hypotheses from our experimentation. And then we'll actually want to do that calculation of outliers. So I've, I've included two methods here, um, interquartile range, which effectively, um, you know, uh, list out all our points of data from um, bottom to top and, and then defines four quadrants, right? So, um, lower to middle and then an upper quadrant. And the inter interquartile range is that uh, place from the end of quartile one to the end of quartile three. So that's our, you know, our you know, standard deviation if you think about it that way. And then I might define and, and I will define an outlier, something that's falling somewhere beyond this upper quartile half. Um, so uh, for example, multiplying this upper quartile by 1.5 or, or two in this case to you know, define somewhere up in this area where you know, these are my outliers. So just a way of, of kind of, uh, I think, pretty pretty simple mathematically. So I'll do that, um, do my calculation, have a few queries here. Um, you can look at a box plot here to get a sense of, of you know, how many outliers I have. I want to tinker with this because I'm, if I'm getting a ton of outliers, then you know, it's probably my sensitivity is a bit off. If I'm getting no outliers, maybe I'm being a bit too strict and you know, the, the differences between the data I'm looking at isn't that massive. You can also look at a sliding window method. And, and here I'm, I'm looking over time and taking cuts of the data and, and uh, you know, effectively saying, I, I expect you know, this data point to be pretty similar to the last eight weeks or 10 weeks. And if it's not, then it's an outlier. So we'll do that as well. Um, and then, you know, like I said, different outlier methods. We'll do some, um, you know, finish some data prep and, and get into an output format. So now this is great. We've we've identified outliers, but uh, I don't know what those outliers are. I don't know which products, which retailers. I don't know much more than I, I think. You know, I think my calculation. I think my math's pretty good. So how do we how do we actually figure something out from this? I'll look at a, a pretty simple here um, Power BI report, um, and I can get some you know some insights out of it, and and really get something from uh, data to actual data. So I can look here at the number of outliers by my retailer. So this helps me start narrowing down what do I actually care about, what do I want to look at. So we can see here um, retailer 13. It's a it's a big retailer, and there's a lot of outliers there. Um, and those two may or may not be related. So anyways, I think I'm interested in retailer 13. I can see a bit about trends, but again, I can't do a lot about a whole retailer across you know entire country or something like that. But I, what I can do is start understanding how are my brands playing into that retailer. So um, I could just use my filter here to select this retailer um, and I can see how I'm doing. So I'm losing at this retailer, which isn't good. It's a big retailer um, and there's a lot of outliers. So I want to understand you know, how are my products doing. So if I click on my bar here, I can see you know, some of my brands in the highlight. It might not be, might not be too visible. 
But I can see this brand here is, is one of my brands and it's red, meaning I, I'm drastically losing share and it's a big brand. So one of my biggest players, if not my biggest player in this retailer uh, isn't doing well, it's losing and, and I need to understand why. So here's the action. We've, we've identified uh, one of our brands at one of our retailers. We can do something about this. We can go look at distribution and price promotions, those sorts of things, but we know where to look now. We, we can do, we can, we can take some level of action from, yeah, you know, a specific brand at a retailer. And that's the whole point of, of this kind of analysis and the experimentation. How do I take my huge universe of data and get it down to something I can, I can, I can do something about? So thinking about how um, Thoroughgood is working with uh, using Dataverse tool to help customers be responsive. And then that's what we're talking about, being resilient, acting with speed, experimenting, responding to our, our changing and, and volatile world. Looking into the, what's urgent. So key business questions, um, new data sets that are available, um, those are interesting things. And you saw how easily we could bring in alternative data. Deb talked about the flexibility and collaborative nature of Databricks, so different languages, scalable infrastructure, um, all those sorts of things, which no matter the problem I'm going to throw at it, um, with some novel coding, with some, some creativity, Databricks is going to help me solve it. Scalability. So we mentioned this, this is dealing with bigger data, um, maybe dealing with a lot of different data sources that are different forms. So you know, Rob talked about structured, unstructured, semi-structured. I have maybe big volumes, but I also have a lot of different, you know, variations or formats of that data to figure out how to deal with. And then how am I getting value out of the new normal? So a couple of examples here, of recent, uh, recent use cases that we've been working on, um, you know, some of these are, are maybe traditional in the sense of, but um, are particularly you know, urgent and important now. So you can see down the list, uh, you know, a number of familiar things relating to the you know, retail, CPG, manufacturing space, and, you know, certainly lots more that are happening. So a couple of parting thoughts here and, and a few next steps of, of kind of how they are getting help, how Databricks can, can help and, and you know, things that we've seen be particularly valuable. So what do we see? What do we see organizations doing? And, and, and Rob mentioned a couple of things, you know, he is seeing as well. Um, acceleration in cloud uh, investment, analytics investment, DevOps investment. So investing in those technology software um, capabilities that allow us to respond quickly to work with flexibility um, and to experiment. Kind of hitting that right on the head, but experimentation. Uh, so we, this has been kind of the theme of today. How do we how do we do things quickly? How do we, you know, throw some stuff at the wall and see what sticks to an extent? Um, something Rob talked about uh, quite a bit was how are what are we doing about our existing you know, forecast models or our, our existing demand planning models? Um, they're, they're probably not right. Um, or, or they're hard to trust. So what do we need to do to refresh them? What, what uh, you know, new features, um, you know, what uh, causations are we now adding to those models to, uh, to make them useful to, to be able to uh, you know, use technology to help us respond? And, and, th and think about kind of the, the big picture, um, what data do we have available to us? So, you know, data lakes and modern data platforms are, you know, really, um, I mean, coming into fruition and they're, they're uh, kind of productionized and, and key assets for organizations. How do we get value out of them? How do we get value out of other data sets, the alternative data sets we've been talking about? And then thinking about time horizon. So Deb talked about this with some of her scenarios, but um, what, what, what do we want to look at in terms of time? And we probably want to look at a lot of things. Do we want to look at the last six months? Do we want to look at the future? Um, do we want to start planning for three, four years down the road? So these are some things we're hearing, some things we're helping customers with. If we specifically talk about, you know, some ways in which uh, which is useful to engage and in ways we've been getting started with some customers. Offering here, and you can see on the screen, a, a hackathon. So an opportunity to work with um, kind of experts in Databricks, experts in, in the field to, you know, scale up people to, you know, exemplify how, how we can use Databricks, how we can collaborate, uh, different methodologies, um, you know, different uh, business cases that, you know, we've seen that we see be, uh, provide value. And it can bubble up from here. So, you know, if it's POCs or accelerating existing investment, um, also type of strategy work. So, something to to consider. You know, depending, uh, no matter where you are in your on your data versus your data analytics overall journey. And a bit more information here about uh, kind of what's the value we see out of it. What what are we trying to get out of out of this? And and really, what uh, what's the goal of of Thoroughgood? What's the goal of Databricks? It's it's helping our customers uh, work with data and and get valuable insights. And, value out of, out of the data and analytics investments and to really improve their business and improve the way in which they're uh, you know, approaching what, what to do. So you can see some of those some of those value drivers here, whether it's um, scaling up, whether it's um, taking advantage of these, those alternative data sets, 
um, whether it's experimenting, which which in the past we haven't done. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and joining us today. A special thank you to Rob for joining us and, and sharing some of his insights and, and experience on, on what he and Databricks are seeing. Um, with that, I'll, I'll close the call. Thank you very much and, and have a great day.